How's everybody doing today? Getting started a little late, I think. I don't know. I'm struggling. How's everybody doing today? Get back on my restream so I can see what the chat is. <laughs> How are you doing, Princess? Glad you could join me. Princess A in the house. Let me share my screen. Uh, let's see. Let's do. Let's do window. You know how we do it. If you got any cybersecurity questions, just drop them in the chat. About to get started in a minute. Let me, uh, knowing I said I was gonna give up pop in 2022, just just not quite working yet. <laughs> we can get started. I need a little something to kick in for me. How's everybody doing today? Uh, had to come <laughs> see about you. I appreciate it. Come check on the old guy. I appreciate it. Come, <laughs> I appreciate it, Princess A. Uh, so let's just go over. Um, I used to go over the videos I did through the week to give people um, time to fall in. So let's do that real quick, then we'll get started. Uh, last week, we did uh, AWS, uh, the SOC services. AWS has a lot of cool features to help you create a, what's up, Netropolis? Uh, a SOC service. Um, so, because remember, you're doing a VPC inside of all of AWS, so they want to give you service. Because if you get hacked, you might get them hacked, right? So they give you a lot of services, and we we went over quite a few of those services: advisor, inspector, uh, quite a few services to help you uh, catch the bad guys. And of course, salute to before the billion. Shout out to my man. Go to uh, subscribe to him. Um, I know he's getting close. You making the money yet, B2B? You making money yet? I know he's super close with uh, getting his hours up. It took me a minute to kind of figure that figure that out. So go to, uh, subscribe to him and check him out. A great content creator. Court, uh, <laughs> content creator. Ooh, I'm struggling today. <laughs> so he's doing big things over there. So I'm always on his channel. So you can't catch me here. You definitely catch me there. Uh, QR codes. When you go to dinner, you scan and stuff or... People don't want to give you menus or different things you can scan. Uh, people are jacking the QR code. So when you scan it, it takes you to a malicious website and they steal all your information. <laughs> all right. So I did a short video on that. Uh, it was actually an FBI warning, FBI QR code scam. So the FBI actually put out a, a watch warning for those QR codes because I guess they're happening all over the United States. So if the FBI putting the warning out, it's usually a nationwide uh, attack. I got my watch art, sir. I'm in review now. Okay, good luck. Congratulations. <laughs> so that I had to, once I got over that hump, B2B, I had to kind of like take a little break and mellow down before I, I wind back up. So uh yeah, I'm sure I'm sure you'll get it. Uh I got mine in like two days. I was surprised because they said they would uh take a month. I think I got mine in two days. So, so once again, be careful those QR codes, especially at dinner when you scan for those menus. I usually want my thumb over it and double check it to make sure nobody's uh, sliding one over top of theirs or trying to uh, get a new one over top of the restaurant. So nobody's uh, trying to steal my, uh, sending me to a bad link and take over my phone, right? Uh, let's see. Where are, where are we getting to the point where we might need a burner phone going? But I'm actually thinking about it, man, now that you bring that up. Um, I don't really do a lot on my phone for, for those particular, but I think you get, you with, you right there, JM. A lot of times, if you ever do um, application, um, I can't even think, MAM, mobile applications, they actually make a container inside your phone. So, right. So if you're doing work stuff in there and work needs to delete work stuff, you would delete that container on your phone, JM. So I'm actually thinking about doing something like that on my phone where, you know, if I do QR codes or download a few things to my phone, 
in this specialized container, kind of like a VM on my phone jam, I could just erase that uh, container like every weekend, right? And it wouldn't do damage to the, the majority of my phone. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of thinking about something like that, JM. That's funny you brought that up. Um, another one was, uh, of course, people sending um, phishing to uh, specifically CEOs and executives, right, trying to get on their phone. Um, sometimes the CEOs and executives aren't as um, sophisticated as regular, regular users. And the cool thing is I actually put, it's called whaling. A whaling is tack is the whale is the big executives on your phone. And one of my, one of my subscribers said we're talking about that in class, right? Because it was kind of... Uh, I guess um, one of those things that came together where I was talking about a, a, a subject that they were doing in class and he just never thought whaling, you know, in a real life example would be the CEO cyber attacks. Um, let's see which one. I, they had some posters on a belt line in Atlanta that had QR codes that said, I, I dare you, facts. So yeah, you gotta, you gotta be careful. It was quite tempting to see, but I'm glad I didn't do it. Yeah, it's it's weird, man. When you see that and you know it's bad, there's probably thousands of people that did it though. Be a be so. Uh, I guess one of my I, FBI warns of fake job posting steals info and money. I think I did this one last year too. So uh, hackers are getting into uh, LinkedIn, uh, Monster, and a lot of times because if you pay a little money, they're gonna let you post right to those uh, job sites. They don't really vet a lot of the people that <laughs> post jobs on their site. Right? So a lot of jobs you go to are, are fake and just stealing your information, right, to try to steal your identity. And another one of my subscribers said that actually happened to him in real life. So obviously, you know, once again, it's it's articles I pick up, but it's happening in real life. So we just want to be careful out there. I always say be careful on these cyber streets. They're dangerous out there. So um just got to get better at it and hopefully the people that are um like the job sites and the other sites are actually getting better too at um vetting people that are they're doing business with them so hopefully we're getting less um i guess bad guys less <laughs> bad websites less bad everything i guess CJM. I also noticed increasing email social engines, so it's easy to mirror a website. Oh, facts. I might do that on Cali. You can pick uh, Linux Cali. You can actually point it to a website and it'll, uh, <laughs> it'll clone a whole website in about 15 minutes, right? Uh, and you can kind of dangle the links of how you want to do it, JM. But yeah, you can easily mirror, like you said, with uh, Cali. You can clone a website in seconds, right? Today, we're going to talk about a well-architected AWS site. Uh, AWS Control Tower is what AWS wants you to use as a blueprint to help you create an AWS well-architected website. Um, Tammy, <laughs> glad you joined us. Is that why on the social engineering of a <laughs> of a job posting site? or <laughs> So, but yeah, so... Uh, so yeah, I might do that as a Cali. Um, and one of the and I, for for y'all that don't know, I'm actually a professor in uh, real life. I teach at a local community college. I think this is gonna be my last semester because me and the university getting into it. I'm old and grumpy, so <laughs> I'm hard headed. <laughs> so uh, so the cool thing though is I'm gonna bring all that to YouTube and uh, share that with y'all. So um, you get a a. A glimpse. I do it more as a lecture. So if if you want to get into cybersecurity, right, you my lectures just tell you kind of which area you want to go into, um, if you're comfortable, and two is just give you a a baby tone of uh, different domains inside of cybersecurity. Right now, I'm studying for some of the AWS uh, certs myself. So I like let me, you know, do some AWS lectures. Um, I do do security reviews in AWS. So that doesn't mean I know it internally, right? I can do a compliance review without knowing every service is out there, right? I just need to make sure it can pass the compliance review for the agency I work for. So 
Oh, there she go. Oh, Tammy. Cali Lennon's club. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. That, yeah. And we, yeah, I might go through it. Uh, I know Gay Bay getting his channel up. I might uh, go through it with Gay Bay. I think that'd be a good, good thing for everybody to check out. Mm. I want to say on the record that I'm proud of B2B, Miss Bavaria, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Princess. CSA. Yeah, shout out to both of those and their tribe, for the Billions, um, let's be finesse. Uh, I put him in the um, lead attorney tribe. <laughs> shout out to the lead attorney. So now nah, you're 100%, Princess A. Like I said, I'm my old guy. I came here to especially help people like uh, before the Billions, young guys trying to make moves. So. Uh, like I said, uh, you know, I try to show up on his ch channel and support him, even, even when he does a 30-hour live. <laughs> so what's up with Edge versus Cloudy? Uh, I might do a little – I need to do a little investigation on that, Metropolis. Um, where I work, they force us to use Edge, and I haven't done very little research in Cloudy because you got to remember, I work for the government. We always we always late <laughs> to the game on the cloudy. So I know what it is. I just haven't dug into it, to be honest. So, um, I need to dig into that in the Metropolis. I need to dig into that. Like I said, I'm a I'm a oak. So like I said, I work for government agencies. They always way behind <laughs> some technology. So so let's jump in and. <laughs> oh, you welcome, man. You welcome. <laughs> So what is control tower? Control tower, we can look at this at a high level, is the master blueprint of what AWS says is a well architecture, right? So when you do control tower, we're going to talk about the segments. And hopefully in two weeks, we're actually going to do a lab where I actually walk through it doing control tower to let it set up a whole AWS architecture environment. But at a high level, it's the blueprint uh managed services that aws uh wants you to use to set up uh because when you use it right it knows it's once again it's uh, approved well architecture uh, been used by thousands of their uh customers and this is what they approved to it so administrator runs uh the tower it creates accounts and then those account customizations you have im roles we're going to dig into the VPC. That's how you create your network, uh, web, app, and database, which parts of them to the internet, which part is private. Uh, Amazon Cloud Duty is the um, security part of that. We're going to dig into that. Uh, the flow logs is coming from the uh, VPC, your network traffic. You got to log all that per compliance. All right? If you're doing HIPAA, FERPA, I do a lot of NIST. 800-53, which is government work, you got to log all your transactions, right? That's where that flow log is. You logging it all into uh, AWS Cloud Watch and Cloud Trail. And over here is the Cloud Watch with the rules. AWS Lambda is basically services you spinning up on the fly. Uh, run over to your, your stack set, trigger your customizations through your stack additions, right? We're going to kind of dig down on each one of those, but that is the blueprint of what they sell as a well architecture AWS setup, right? So why would I talk, just talk about and go over, right? <laughs> Number one is if you're working for a company, you want to use what AWS says is the blueprint, right? I do compliance for large companies. So if you're a large company, it's nine times out of 10, you're going to want to use the blueprint or a lot of pieces of the blueprint, right? You don't want to do something that's not been used and not been tested. The crazy thing is kind of why I've been reading through this. It's a, a, I would say a lot different than what I would do on prem and used to seeing, right, from my AWS perspective. So we're gonna dig down and control. And for my, for my part of uh, cybersecurity, right, this is GRC. We'll dig in. GRC stands for governance, governance, risk, and compliance. Right. So when you do a well architected AWS setup. Right, governance is this, right? Your administrator is governing and set up. You got your logs, so you can figure out what happened if you've been hacked. You can understand what happened. Risk is uh, the security part, and once again, we're digging into that. Is it'll tell you what's in compliance and what it deems as not secure, 
right? So if you take all the things that are not secure, you can figure out the risk of your organization, right? So the compliance of that is how much of that stuff did you do and, and does um, fit in your compliance? Would the cloud tire be similar to the main domain controller in the LAN or WAN professor? Yeah, I think you could say that at a certain level, JM. Because you write the controller, controls everything. It controls um, how you communicate. This is a little bigger, though, right? Because you, the AWS Towers is kind of controlling everything within your organization, right? The main controller is really just controlling the network piece. Even though you can't get some logging out, it's control. The AWS Tower, when we get into it, we're going to talk about compliance, risk, uh, creating users, creating a network control traffic, um, creating a shout out to Tam yesterday on uh, Women in Linux. We're going to talk about the CDI pipeline. If you're programming, where you check your code out, how does your code get from dev to production? Right. So this controls all of that, JM. So it's it controls a lot more than just the domain controller. But shout out to A and I, I, I A and me. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. You uh, killed it on Black Heights yesterday. I really enjoyed your interview. So everybody go check him out. Uh, I know he's getting his channel up. Uh, that's the guy I go to. Anything machine learning, artificial intelligence. That's the guy I'm going to send you to right there. Right. I'm gonna give you a little bit, but when you need to get into the uh, the stats, the data, the training the machine learning to do what it's supposed to do, right? That's the guy I'm gonna send y'all to. So go check him out. So the AWS Control Tower provides the easiest way to set up and govern a secure multi-account AWS environment called a landing zone. It creates your landing zone using AWS organizations, bringing your ongoing account management and governance, as well as implementation best practices based on AWS experience with thousands of customers as they move to the cloud. Right. So that's the part I was talking about. Right. So using the best practices based on AWS experience, working with thousands of customers. Right. So I work at a large. Um, a local government. And they're talking about going to AWS Tower. So I was actually locked, talking to some of their um, AWS consultants, and they said, this is what they're uh, pushing. This is what they believe is going to be the best of breed for AWS um, setups in the future. Right. Extend governance into new or existing accounts, gain visibility into compliance status quickly. AWS Control Tower will help you get started quickly with built-in governance and best practices. Right. So at your company or are you interviewing or are you trying to get in the AWS game, people want to know that, you know, what is the best practices? What is best of breed? What is built in governance? And two is you doing what AWS <laughs> uh, is going to expect you to do. You doing what AWS is going to is recommending you to do. Right. So if you bring that up in your company, if they go talk to an AWS consultant, he's going to. Uh, uh, edify what you just said, right? That you know what you're doing. So that's one reason I was like, let me get into the uh, AWS Control Tower. If they send that's best of breed, let me figure out what's going on, right? So they automate the setup of your multiple AWS environments with a few clicks. The setup employs blueprints that capture AWS best practices for configuring AWS security management services to govern your environment. Blueprints available to prop to provide identity management, federated access to accounts, centralized logging, established cross-account security audits, define workflows for provisioning accounts and implementing accounts baseline with network configurations. Right? So when you click on a button, it's gonna, like I said, set up your whole, your, your whole infrastructure, your whole environment and all that for you, right? So there's some config files. You can tell it how you want to set up from its best practice practices we're going to look at a couple of those especially from a, a bpc standpoint right what does that look like from from basically networking right and of course networking is the, the weakest part of my aws game is networking so so when you look at the infrastructure that's kind of what it's going to look like from a um, 
architecture uh, design, right? At the top is the AWS organization account. You got your S3 buckets, AWS uh, code pipeline, uh, service catalog parameters to go to your pipeline, AWS organizations, and AWS single sign-on, right? So single sign-on is right when you get all your users created, get them set up, get them validated, get them tagged, right? What resources can your users get to with that one password, right? And that's one of the first things I was looking at from a security perspective, AWS org, all right, and AWS single sign on. Two, two we talk about this later is most companies, right? You take your AWS, sync it to your own prem using an Active Directory. So yeah, all your Active Directory users that are on prem is going to get synced up to AWS single sign on. So those people that are signed on on prem, they are they just log into AWS with their same password, right? Then they get federated or use any um, services that you deem coming from the AWS SSO. But right, that's going to sync to your own prem active directory or whatever you do. Most 99% of large companies are using AW, I mean, uh, Microsoft active directory, right? That's just so common. Then if you're using something else, right, you just sync. If you just use an LDAT, I guess for a database and you're using our Linux, you would just also sync that to your AWS SSO. Right, so then they don't have to change their password. And two is if you shut somebody off on prem, you can have it generate up a rule to automatically take them out of AWS. Or because sometimes you got to escort people out. <laughs> so you escort a DB out or SA out or not not before the billions, but you know he got high access. So if we if we got to escort him out, right, we got to yank all privileges out of there ASAP, right? So that's gonna come from the AWS SSO and the on prem Active Directory. So you kind of sync those up. So when you take one out, a lot of times you run a batch job every four or five hours. But if you need to take somebody out now, how do you do that, right? Usually you have an automated job, go up there and, you know, take out all their access out of AWS. So now, so too, is you're going to have shared service environments. You see to the left, part of that is the account baseline and shared services. One of them will be the VPC, right? That's what can they get on your AWS network, right? You're going to have web servers, application servers, databases, um, probably have a flat network up there so people can drop uh, Word documents, XSL. You split them up in the uh, S3 buckets, probably by departments, and give those departments groups. But two, those are going to be shared services. How do they get to it? And two, when they get to it, what are you allowing them to see? Yes, sir. All services. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, you got to make sure you can get them out of there. <laughs> so that's one thing you got to test. Then the log archive. Um, a lot of people don't really, uh, security people care about it. Programmers care about it a little bit. But uh, from a compliance standpoint, you want to be logging everything. Who's going into a database? Who's deleting a record? Who's trying to get to a record they shouldn't be? Right. All that should be in your log part. Because from a compliance reason, if we ever got hacked, you got to be able to go back and look at those logs to see what happened, right? So that's where your uh, log archive accounts are. My favorite part, too, is where you run it from a security account perspective, right? There's security hub, guard duty, inspector, advisor. So those are a ton of uh, security services that you can use in there, right? So you can lose that somebody's running a strange account. Advisor is going to tell you. Are you doing what's recommended by the AWS control tower? Because when you set it up, you can start changing stuff and break it, right? Not break it, but making it less secure. So you got uh, services out there to check to make sure if somebody's changing stuff. Are you cool with that? Um, and two is that stuff should go to, I'm on a security team. We get emails on that. And this is the part over here that I struggle with too. And we don't definitely talk about that is, how do you set up a three tier or four tier uh, architecture? Uh, how do you get your DNS, right? Your DNS is your URL with your IP, right? How do you set that up? We're gonna talk a little bit about on-prem versus in the cloud. A lot of times you have uh, VPN tunnels between there to keep them in sync. Some of your work is done on-prem, some of your work is done in cloud, right? So you gotta get all that set up with your networking team. Uh, what networking subnets are you going to use? Um, what subnets are you going to let talk to subnets, right? 
Some subnets are going to be open to the internet. Some subnets are going to be private. Some subnets you're going to need a NAT gateway going through a VPN tunnel. All right, so you got to get all that set up properly. Yep, you got to have those logs, Jan. Without logs, you toast. And two, if you don't have the logs, your fine is going to get bigger. So if you get hacked by a company and when the, like if you do HIPAA and you do something and health hospital come in and they say, where are your logs? Right. That's who uh, reviews hospitals for security. If you don't have logs, your fine is going to be a thousand twenty four, probably a thousand dollars a record. Plus, if you got logs, your uh, fine could be low as twenty five dollars. Why would that be is if you have logs. Your uh, architecture is more mature. If you have no logs, that's almost considered negligent from a legal standpoint. Right. So you definitely want to have logs because that's going to definitely have an input on your fine if you ever got hacked. Use change proxy servers to hide them. Um, we're not trying to track them down, Jay, and we're just trying to figure out what they're stolen, right? So there's two things logs for. You, you're correct from that. I, I don't expect in the United States, I work for a large state agent, we're not catching a hacker. I just need to figure out what he touched, what he stolen, and how much of our data did he stole, right? So in the logs, I could say, okay, he took the whole database. Like you said, he sent it to Chicago, but then he got moved to Russia. I don't care where he took it, JM. I just need to know what he took, right? Because of health and hospital come to me, I got to say, well, he stole 100,000 records. He stole 200,000 records. In the logs, I saw this user who I think was him. He did a phishing jam, but I can. it counts how many records he touched, right? I don't care... Where he took them, James, I just need to tell uh, HIPAA, OSHA, FERPA what got stolen, right? If I can't tell them what got stolen, I could be fine negligent, right? And my fire is going to be extra high, right? But you are correct. Um, like I said, I, 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 I have no illusion I'm going to catch them, JM. <laughs> I have no illusion. I just need it from the logs. Where do they go? What do they steal into us? The logs probably going to tell me how they got in. So if I, I need to figure out how they got in so I can block it. But once again, JM, you're correct. I have no delusion that I'm going to catch them or that IP was something I can track or they wasn't um, spoofing IPs from somewhere else, JM. Yeah, I, I have no illusion that I'm going to get that, JM. I'm just trying to figure out what's stolen, right? Because like I said, there's two parts of cybersecurity, right? Compliance, I'm just, I got to figure out, like I said, tell my agency when they come and review me what was stolen. If I can't do that, like I said, my fine is going to be astronomical, JM. They're going to uh, configure me negligent. But look, chime in if that makes sense, JM. But like I said, um, I have no <laughs> illusion that I'm going to catch the hacker. I'm trying to figure from a compliance standpoint what they stole. A landing zone is part of control towers. We'll architect it, mode account, multi account uh, environment based on security and compliance best practices. AWS Control Tower automates the setup of new landing zones using best practice blueprints for identity, federated access, and account structure. All right. So, and JM, yeah, I'm old and crabby. I've just been in this game so long. I've like 99% of the people you, that stole money, especially outside of the United States, you ain't going to never catch them because half of them in nations, there's no extradition on those people, right? But then you get some greedy people trying to get the um, Bitcoin, want Bitcoin money internally. But most of those nation states are coming from uh, nations that we that don't like us, right? So what is a landing zone? Example of a blueprints that are automatically implemented, including create a multi-account environment. I kind of showed you that before. Each one of those boxes were is was uh, owned by an account. We talked about uh, providing identity through the AWS single sign-on. Default directory provide federated access to accounts using AWS SSO. Federated just means when I log onto the account, I get a token or some way where I can go to different services in AWS. I don't have to re-log in because AWS has already uh, gave me a token and validated my um, privileges so I can get stuff to what I'm supposed to get to. Uh, we talked about this centralized logging with CloudTrail. Uh, and AWS config store in this uh, Amazon Simple Storage uh, service, Amazon S3. Uh, enable cross-account security audits with AWS identity 
access management and single sign-on. The landing zone set up by AWS control towers managed using a set of mandatory and strongly recommended guardrails, which customers select through a self-service console to ensure that accounts and configuration uh, comply with uh, the company's policies. We'll dig down into that. That's one thing, too, about uh, AWS control tower and landing zone. They give you guardrails and um, things they strongly recommend or stuff that's mandatory, right? Uh, does a person have to have MFA? Does a person have to have uh, 14 characters? Can, you know, does the S3 bucket needs to be encrypted at a certain level, right? So these are all the guardrails um, and compli compliances that you that you're going to set up with AWS Control, right? That's the governance, right? We're governing what you can do with your um, your setup, right? I need to check into that. I believe so because when you set up to, uh, I need to look into that now. I would think so because Kerberos is just so. Um, I'm gonna call it old, but it's so standard. I, I would think I, I'm a double check in there. I, I'm just guessing, but I would say 90% sure. Um, because it's just such a um a known standard, right? Um, because you can do Kerberos, yeah. So I'm sure if it didn't, I would be surprised because uh Kerberos is used by a lot of big companies, JM. But you already know that, yeah. That's just so uh so used and and, and especially on prem and it has been for I've been in the game for 30 years, so I know I've no, I've been talking about cover us for at least 20. Account factory automates provisioning from new accounts in your organization. That's a configurable account template that helps you standardize your provisioning of new accounts with pre-approved account configuration. You can configure your account factory with pre-approved network configurations, uh, region selections. Enable self-search for your builders to configure and provision new accounts using AWS uh, catalog. Additionally, you can take advantage of control tower solutions like Account Factory for Terraform. Shout out to the Wemix and Linux. That's <laughs> Tim's always talking about Terraform to automate and provision the customization of control tower accounts, meet your business and security policies before delivering to end users. Right. So any organizations, right? When we onboard. How do you get that person the privileges they need to the system they need, the database, the file system, uh, the AWS, and even on-prem resources, right? So that's what your account of factory will help you do. And usually we do it, we say it's a job functions. Like you you work in an account and you account receivables, you're going to hit this um, account receivable template. It's going to give you everything you need on-prem and in the cloud. The two part of that, we're going to probably have an acknowledgement chain or, or provisioning where your supervisor set all that up for you. Uh, click a button with their rights or her rights, right? They can give their uh, employees or people that report to them the systems they need, right? If it's just a base system, so security doesn't care. But if you're giving them some high level privileges, right? Uh, security can get an email and we can go in and write validate, right? Because we want governance above them, right? So security, uh, we're going to govern, okay, this person has a certain FTP server or this person, aka before the billions, they're a developer, right? So they're going to need certain privileges to do development, right? And in development, right, you're going to have DevOps and SecOps, right? So if you're doing security operations inside a development pipeline, you're going to have an elevated escalator escalated privilege that we probably want to review or just double check well yes and no jam hopefully this part right here when we set the uh template up hr just clicking a button right and realistically hr should be delegating their supervisors to their organization to do it so hr should basically said this person's on board they're in the accounting department right so from our templates, we know they're in accounting. So these are the job templates in accounting. Now, for some reason, they get some out of accounting. We might send security messages like, okay, this person's got accounting and manufacturing floor. Why do they have those extra privileges, right? They could be on a special project or something, but the template, right, can control how much a person can give to them. Then when we go back from security, we do audits. Right, we can audit. Okay, this person has accounting and manufacturing floor. 
we need to audit their privileges and just make sure they don't have extended privileges or somebody gave them that some they should not have. So hopefully from an HR perspective, and we'll go through that from our uh, onboarding workflow, hopefully a, um, HR just clicking a couple buttons and we have all this stuff set up in our onboarding template and workflow. So, so from HR perspective, they're just clicking on buttons. Okay. And this is, uh, we'll talk about that coming up too. So landing zone, we were talking about the multiple accounts. We talked about the AWS service catalog, centralized logging. Uh, we talked about AD. And if you see right there, they actually have AD and AD directory connectors to AWS SO to sync them up, right, JM? So I just need to double check to make sure they got a Kerberos connector. But at the top, you see you're coming in, getting your S3 buckets, you got your code pipeline, AWS organizations. AWS organizations at the top, like we talked about, it gets broken down in directories and um, directories like accounting. Uh, inside of accounting, you have accounts receivable, payable. Probably too, we have contracts in there. So even from security, you got what the CISO can do. Then we got our security analysts. Then we got our security architects, right? So those are different organizations. Single sign-on, right? We're gonna sync them to single sign-on. Then at the bottom, you got your shared services once again. We're logging everything. Then your security, um, oh, you and your department, right? Where is the? There it is. AWS service catalog is when they come in. The catalog is what AWS services they can get to inside, you know, control term. And uh, when we set that uh, workflow up, what are we going to let certain departments get have access to an AWS service catalog? All right. And we're going to build that up ourselves. What service you can get to, what third parties you can get to. Right. So but then that's just going to be part of your regular workflow too. When you log into there. So that's the initial setup from the landing zone and part of the security baseline of that we talked about a cloud trails they're going to the s3 bucket anything you do we're logging aws config configuration for logs files stored in a central place part of that is config rules what s3 buckets you can get through what relational database buckets you can get through identity access mfa um, rewrite on a s3 bucket like a file system so those departments gonna have search and configuration rules of what they can do, right? And that's what makes uh, AWS control towers so, uh, I guess, nice is it sets up the uh, skeleton for you, it sets up the blueprint for you, sets up the template for you, right? It, so you want to do all that stuff, you know, just off of memory. Once again, uh, uh, identity access management, cross account access, VPC, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, configuring the initial networking for account includes deleting default VPCs, setting up your regions and your shared services, uh, landing zone notifications, using CloudWatch alarms and events are configured to send notifications to the root account login, console failures, API, uh, Amazon Guard Duty is configured to view and manage and findings in the member account. So when you log in, what do you have access to? So the cool part about that is your zone notifications. One of those is what if a user tries to log on to something 100 times in 15 seconds, right? That's an alarm because that's an automated attack. Nobody's going to be able to physically log in there, right? So that could be denial of service or somebody's trying to do a brute force attack, right? So when you take your logs versus your landings on notifications, those are the uh, things we're looking for, right? for information to get to sent to the security team. And those are stuff we're gonna set up in the lab in the future. So we can actually uh, do this. There's a free tier out there. So I'm creating some labs. So, and I'll drop them in my Google Google Drive. So we could go through the lab then I'll give you the lab. Uh, and you can set it up and for free in your Amazon free tier if you wanna learn. And we can just kind of go through some of the um, basic GRC stuff um, that we'll be looking for in a company. So. That's one of the things I want to do in the future. Uh, account bending machines. The account bending machine is AWS uh, landing zone key component. The AVM is provided in an AWS service catalog, which allows customers to create new accounts and organizational units 
pre-configured with the account security baseline and a predefined network. So that's what salute, uh, Citizen Lou. So that's what we were talking about when we were talking about creating um when HR would create a user, I think Jam about that. They would go to our account vending machine, right? And say, okay, this is accounting users, account receivable, right? And that tells you what organization unit they can go to. Pre-configured this was the template, all right? Shout out to Citizen Lou. He's studying AWS architect. So as part as that is what privileges are we going to give you inside that architecture, right? Even if you're on security, I'm an analyst, right? I, as an analyst, I don't have any rewrite access to any of the company's databases. Um, I don't have anything. Now, I have view to a lot of stuff. I can view logs. I can view uh, security. I can view keys, right? But even as a security person, I don't I don't get access to a lot of the company records. And two is I don't want to because if somebody come up missing, I'll be like, dude, I don't, I don't have access to that. Black ops don't do that, right? So, so, um, but that is what the account bending machine is. And shout out to JM, you we call it a job function. So each job function will have some in account bending machine. So HR would say, okay, this person's in security, this person's in development, this person then inside development, they will have account in the vending machine that they could pick and give to that user. Right. So that makes it easy. Um, HR doesn't need, and even a person supervisor, they just, okay, this person's coming to do this job role. These are the accesses, right? And somebody shout out to, um, yeah, it actually is using uh, IAM, Citizen Loop. What uh, AWS Control Tower does, it uses uh, Terraform and uh, CloudFormation to do it automatically, right? Because if a user's coming on, HR is not going to want to go in and do the uh, to do the um, uh, IAM console. You want to hit a button, right, for onboarding, and that stuff happens, right? Because so, when you come in, we're going to have workflows for that. But you, the part of that that workflow is going to be using the AIM because we look at AIM, right? They got those uh, automatic features and templates you can call through the CLI. We just uh, setting those up inside uh, Control Tower to do that automatically. So, yep, it's just doing it, like I said, do a workflow. So could they use AIM? Because, right, if you HR, you don't want to go, right? HR ain't going to do anything like that, system, right? That's going to be, yo, you, you the architects, so you're going to set all that stuff up. So you're going to set up the workflows using cloud formation or Terraform. Then when they click on it, it's going to be doing those AIM controls in the background, right? So you're going to set up templates for HR to call. So they just going to hit a button, like I said. Oh, this person's onboarding, Professor Blocks up in security. So then it's going to go to CISO because they send those emails. And email go to... Uh, the CISO and the CISO say, so yeah, he's going to be doing this job function, that job function, and this job function. And like you said, behind the scenes, yeah, you got it. It's going to give you access to the S3 bucket. Uh, you can only read. You can't write to it. You security. You ain't doing any development. Uh, shout out to uh, B2B. He's a developer, so he his job function can write an S3, get in the code pipeline, right? So all of that is going to be done from the account vending machine, right? Because we're going to create a workflow for it. Oh. Yep, exactly like role based uh, professor. I'm a DBA. They usually call it uh, AB for attribute because role based is usually specifically for uh, databases. But now nah, you're right. They call it with an A attribute based because inside um, AWS, you can set up a lot of attributes and privileges through roles. They actually do call it role, uh, role for mission. So, yeah, yep, that's exactly what it is. So yeah, we uh shout out to Citizen Lou. I'm sure we'll be partnering up on a few things. Let's see what we got like Amplify Astra combined facts, exactly like that, man. Exactly like that. So two is and two is from a, like I said, from an organization standpoint, when you onboard stuff, they don't know anything about that, Citizen Lou. They just want to hit a button. <laughs> He's in security team, right? This is the permission, right? So the cool thing from a security stamp uh standpoint is we get to go through all the roles to make sure they're at least privileges, make sure a lot of times you get over privileges, you know. Shout out to Citizen Lou. I know sometimes he just want to have uh, admin privileges, but I'm like, no, nah, that's too many privileges, man. I can't give you admin, Citizen Lou. That's too many privileges for you, right? But no, nah, I'm just joking with you. But as security team, we do got to go through each one of those job functions. 
So when people give to them, they're not getting too many roles inside or too many privileges inside AWS. Because what happens is if somebody get fished, right? If they if they're a developer, but they got DBA roles, right? They could drop our database, right? So you're trying to give each job function just the privileges they need to do their job. Because as we go through later on, if somebody gets fished and they're a developer, what can they do and how much can they help hurt the organization? Right? Somebody in the HR, right? <laughs> Citizen, Citizen Lou be getting them admin privileges. I got to shut him down. I got to shut him down. <laughs> That's why he laughing. He know how it goes. People hate security. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we just want to give the, the, the exact privileges they need to do their job. But let's, let's get real, though. I, I do this in real life. Sometimes as a small company, you just need some extra privileges because you don't want to switch users. You don't have a, a DevOps person. You don't have a sec op person. All that citizen Lou, he got to do all that work. He don't want to log into three different accounts, right? So you got to give the right privileges to the right organization to do their job. Right? I don't want to be a hindrance to security, right? But at large organizations, they have all those jobs. So we really focus on, on least privilege, right? And that's what they're talking about here. User access. Provide least privileges. Individuals use access to AWS accounts as essential and foundation component to AWS account management. The AWS landing zone solution provides customers with two options to store their users, uh, the SSO and uh, the directory default. Federated is syncing that to uh, Active Directory on-prem or LDAP or Kerberos or whatever the co uh, company's is. And we got that coming up. Yep, shout out to JM. But those developers like Citizen Lou, they be wanting too many privileges, JM. You got to watch them, man. <laughs> Citizen Lou going to run to, uh, I love when developers run on my CISO. High Towers impeding, <laughs> impeding development, right? Professor Black Ops is impeding development, <laughs> right? So you got to make sure you have a balance, right? Because sometimes least privileges, if they like uh, Citizen Lou and they need DevOps because, you know, they shut down databases, restarting databases. One of my developers be building databases. I'm like, we got a whole DBA team. Why are you why are you building that? Why are you building databases? Right. So facts, 100 percent attack service. You got it, Jim. So and two is. And I'm hopefully going to do that with Gabe. Hey, we're going to actually do a red team, blue team. So if they, if he, if he hacks a user and it's got too many privileges, right? I'm toast, JM. <laughs> so, so this is a little laughing at me because he know I'm true. He knows it's true. Yeah, yeah. Developers be wanting admin all the time. You got to stop them. But I do have developers <laughs> complain on me. <laughs> Everybody's used to me in order game. I always tell them, man. You're the boss. I advise you. I'm advising you. He got too many privileges. So when he get fished, we toast, right? So, <laughs> so we just talked about the notifications, which is cool. Uh, AWS landing zone, which is inside uh, control tower alarms and events to send notifications to root accounts. Shout out to um, Citizen Lou, uh, console sign and failures, API authentication failures, VPC gateway peering. Anything that happens inside your organization that's going to throw an error, you can figure out how big that error is and who do you want it to go to. Shout out to Tam. Yesterday, we were uh, chopping it up is even in, especially for developers like Citizen Lou, you got to give them something to work with. You just can't tell them the app is broke. <laughs> the app is broke, right? What logs? What happened? Was it the... Uh, was it the VPC? Was it the privilege? Was it, you know, uh, the EC2? Did the EC2 fail? It couldn't write, right? What notifications are you sending to the people uh, who's who owns that particular object, right? So, and two, from a compliance status, so there's two parts to it, right? There's operational failure. Shout out to NC Worker. I'm glad you can join us. Going over AWS Tower, just talking about from a well architected standpoint. Shout out to Game Over. All right. So I've been picking on Lou. That's my guy. I know he's a developer. Shout out to B2B. They're both developers, right? Sometimes security gets in their way, right? So um, we're talking about least privileges. Now we're talking about if something happens, how are you going to notify people through email, put it on their Slack channel, put it in their um, Discord channel, right? All these connections email could be uh, sent to slack 
sent to Discord, right? Even though I'm trying to block Citizen Lou, I got to help him, you know. Uh, <laughs> if I put all the security across Citizen Lou, right, I got to give him something to work with, right? If I can't tell, you can't log in here, you can't get to this, how am I helping debug stuff, right? Because real talk is security and the organizations usually have a, a tug of war, right? We always joke. I want you to have a just enough security to do your job, right? But sometimes that security is going to get on your damn nerves, right? So what does that look like? And how, as a security architect, I can help you uh, work through all that security I'm, put, I'm putting on top of you, right? So that's my goal. Right? What's up, Teak Job? How are you doing, man? So uh, landing zones, notifications, right? And we just kind of walked through it and... I was picking on Citizen Lou, right? Um, developers, how much, how many, how much privilege are you going to give them to their organization? And even side development, there's different layers, right? What I give to a junior programmer is not what I'm going to give to a senior programmer. Senior programmer is not going to be able to do the DevOps that a senior programmer would be. Right? DevOps is not going to be doing the same thing as security operations, right? That's actually from a job title, but a lot of small companies. Citizen Lou might be doing all that work <laughs> at his company, depending on how big it is. So, so how much security am I going to put on top of him, right? So he can do his job effectively. But if his account gets fished, I don't want him to be overprivileged, right? So if they took his account, they'd be able to shut down everything in the, in, in the company, right? So we got to make that work. So once again, the uh, blueprint for that is uh, AWS Control Tower. It's kind of the blueprint for an overall um, setup of um, a an AWS um, installation, right? So part of the tower, which is cool, is preventative and detective guardrails. What are guardrails? Stuff that on your account, I can hopefully guide you to, to do the right thing from a security perspective, right? Guardrails are pre-practiced governance rules for security operations and compliance that customers can select and apply enterprise-wide or to a specific group of an account, right? Some of it's going to be security-wide and depending on uh, the development team you in and projects, certain projects might be, uh, we call it the wild, wild west. You just in there coding, doing what you want. Other projects are more uh, detailed, agile, specific. You know, you got the DevOps, the SecOps, development, everything goes in the code pipeline. When you're checking in the code pipeline, the code pipeline review is right. That's a more mature organization, right? So I'm going to set that up differently than I would a uh, Wild Wild West. And both of those development teams could be in the same company. With these rules, though, I can do one for an enterprise and have one for a specific, right? The Wild Wild West, of course, will have less guardrails and detective rails than my mature side, right? The guardrails are expressed in plain English and, and enforce specific uh, government policies for AWS environments that can be enabled with AWS organizational unit. Each guardrail has two dimensions. It can either be preventative or detective. It can either be mandatory and optional. Preventive guardrails establish intent and prevent deployment of resources that don't conform to a policies. For example, enable AWS cloud trail in all accounts, right? So every account is going to get logged. That is a preventive guardrail. You can't take it off. Detect the guardrail, for example, detect whether Public read access to Amazon S3 is allowed. Continuously monitor deploy resources for non-conformance. Right. So even though that's set, even though it's non-conformant, we don't block it. We just send an email to that person's probably supervisor and to the security team. Why does that person have a, a public read access? Public is over the internet. Who's reading this S3 bucket over the internet? Right. Well, why is that happening? Right. Once again. For performance, especially from compliance, that was that's what that looks like. Right? Cool thing, once again, built in the AWS control towers there. I just need to, to say, do I want it on? Do I want it pre preventative or do I want it detective? Shout out to Helmet. I'm glad you can make it. <clears throat> and this now we're talking about the governance part, right? These are the things I could set up from a governor's perspective, right? That's that GRC life. We're talking about the governance. How do I govern what the developers do, right? How do I govern 
what Citizen Lou can do, right? I'm gonna put that on his account and lock him down, right? Uh, shout out to B2B, right? So what things can I force him to do and what things do I let him do, but I wanna be aware of if, if he's not doing what I want him to do, right? Right, that's that's governance. And a lot of times too is, you know, you, you wanna do with detective, um, especially preventive. I, nine times out of 10, I don't really wanna prevent somebody from doing something. Uh, that's very rare. Uh, AWS control automatically translates guard uh, rails into granular AWS policies, establishing configuration baseline for AWS cloud formation. That's their automatic. That's their automated tool. Um, Terraform is one. Their tool, I think, is actually based on Terraform. Is cloud formation prevents configuration changes for underlying implementations using service control policies for preventive guardrails. Continuously detect configuration changes through AWS config rules for detective updating guardrail status on AWS control tower dashboard. So let's uh, the tower operates a curated set of guardrails based on AWS best practices, common customer policies for governors. You can auto, auto you can automatically leverage guardrails as part of your landing zone. So some examples of these is. This allows changes to AWS IM roles set up by the AWS control tower, the cloud formation, right? So if I set some up and it's mandatory, why is somebody taking it off? Detect public reaccess for a law of archives. Like why is it put open to the internet? This allows changes to bucket policies uh, created by AWS tires for large archive. This allow cross region networking, right? So those are some of the mandatory things you, you would set up that It'd be really weird why you would want somebody to change it. Uh, mandatory option, all account provision on OU with op optional guardlines are enabled automatically to inherit these guard uh, guardrails. Detect whether public right access to Amazon S3 bucket is allowed. Public is through the internet. So detect whether MFA for the root users enabled. The root user <laughs> controls everything. So you definitely want that on MFA. Detect whether encryption is enabled in the EBS volume attached to an, uh, to an Amazon EC2 instance. I do government work, so I, every uh, file system needs to be encrypted, <laughs> right? Because if somebody steals that file from that uh, system, um, it needs to be encrypted. Uh, the Tower Dashboard gives you continuous visibilities. You can view the number of OUs and accounts, provision and number of guardrails enabled. That's it. Uh, I thought I had a picture of that. So that's it. Uh, the control tower, the guardrails in there. Let's see. You can put developers in their own VLAN. Uh, you could, but uh, you could, but from um, I'm just thinking you would have them on their own VLAN because you have uh, we usually have a test and we call it uh model office that looks like production sometimes we have integration because you got multiple teams working together so part of that would be um yeah i would put them in their own vlan and, and two is um you could put tags on certain ec2 so if whatever's running in production if they're not a devops dba they couldn't do those um resources in um development I'm just pausing a little bit. Yeah, I would definitely put developers in their own VLAN. Uh, I wouldn't say their own VLAN. I would let them get into any VLAN, probably but production, unless they were DevOps or SecOps uh, developers, JM. Um, and we're actually going to walk through that in the lab. Not today, but coming up, I'm going to set that up. Um, JM per control towers, best practices, and we can really dig into that and see what that looks like. I'm just kind of doing off the top of my head. Um, all right. I'm, I'm going to hold you to that. I ain't been studying well at all, Citizen Lou. I keep I keep pushing mine back. But shout out to you. Yeah, you going to do them both? You going to do Dev and uh, um, Ar Associate Architect? Because I want to do... Um, Hell, I was gonna say I was gonna check the uh practitioner at the end of the month and I was gonna start doing DevOps, man. But like I said, I ain't got a 17 years, man. I'm rusty, so 
Uh, I, that's that's aggressive, Citizen Lou. You young, though, man. I'm gonna let you handle that. I also disabled rooting in the company mobile device, Professor. I also disabled rooting in the company. Oh, that's true. That's true. Uh, for us, we use um, um, a mobile application management uh, application. And inside that application, if you uh, jailbreak your phone, it, it will uh, say it's out of compliance and it won't let you let you log into the network at all, JM. So that's true. But JM, I'm gonna be setting some of those uh, guardrails <laughs> and setting that up in there, so we'll see what that looks like, JM. So in real life, because to be honest, uh, I'm not letting any mobile device connect to my network. Management's gonna be mad, so. I'm just going to block that all together so I don't even have to worry about that, Jane. Now, true, it's a lot of it's overlap. So I was going to do practitioner, uh, DevOps, more programming, send programming up, checking the pipeline. I was going to go architect. Then they had a special security cert. So those were the four. Those are the four, four certs I'm going to try to get this year, Citizen Lou. But I'm blaming on my age, Citizen Lou. I can't remember like I used to. <laughs> so I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. That's what I'm shooting for. That's what I'm shooting for. Um, once again, that was the overview of the AWS controls, setting up all those uh, regions and uh, users. Um, uh, security hubs and alerts. We're talking about security hub with the alerts uh, that are part of the AWS lifecycle, which is cool. A lot of those services hook into other services and they work together. So here's an overview of the solution. Uh, the security hub enabled Lambda enables the security hub to manage accounts. The Lambda functions loop through all the supported regions in the members accounts, assuming the role the uh, enabling security hub hub to look at the cis benchmarks which is the center for internet security we're going to look at a couple of those um uh things they want you to do or findings member accounts are registered to security hub and account invitation sent to the member account the invitation is accepted in the member accounts when the new accounts are successfully vended by the account factory which we were looking at a control tower lifecycle trigger Lambda function to loop through the process again. So in the control tower at the bottom is the control tower lifecycle, right? That's the blueprint. Security hub has a lot of security feature. I did a live yesterday talking about the security services events. So it sends an invitation to the security hub. The invitation's uh, accepted and the security hub is enabled, right? So now when you envision, so now when the control tower, like we talked about, provisions a new account right it goes to security hub it checks and we're going to look at some uh how long is the user password how long do, does it uh stay in before it, it expires right so it puts all that um onboarding requirements on it we're going to look at a couple of those here coming up here's the dashboard we were talking about the security hub lifecycle dashboard so at the bottom it shows you you only got 35% of the CIS checks that pass, right? Also, it's got the PCI DSS, that's credit cards. So you can put through the security hub which one of these compliances you want to do, and it'll write them. You can do multiple compliance, right? So you 35% on the CIS, but you could actually be 60% on the uh, PCI DSS. Multiple uh, companies, we call it harmonizing. You're going to have multiple, multiple compliances on your organization. Have you done any freelance work on Hacker One, Professor? Uh, no, I do all my freelance work in um, Upworks. Um, I do mostly uh, compliance work. I do a lot of NIST um, freelance work, um, which is basically people trying to do work for the United States government. Um, if you are a third party for a federal client, you got to be at their security level, meaning basically you got to have a thousand pages of paperwork. So I help companies. Uh, do that paperwork like we talked about too. Uh, setting up these standards to figure out: Are you at thirty-five percent? You at sixty percent? If you at thirty-five percent, they're not gonna let you get that government contract, right? And so my job is to get you up to like eighty percent, so you can win government work and pay me a bag, right? So that's usually what I do, JM, from from a freelance work. I'm not a hacker. Um, shout out to um, Alpha Cyber One, Textual Chatter. Most of those guys are red team. I'm straight blue team and I stay in I stay in my lane with that JM. I do a little hacking work to validate 
Like when I set this up, I'm going to do some vulnerability scans. I'm going to do a little red teaming stuff, but I'm strictly blue team and more uh, federal compliance, to be honest, Jan. Um, I work with a lot of red team because every three years they have to come out and attack what I set up. So I'm usually working with the, those guys. So I understand what they're doing. Right. But I don't I don't freelance in that. Um, and two is that government uh, bag is a little better, bigger than the hacker pen test bag, JM. <laughs> a, a little bigger. But if we look on there, that's the dashboard. We get the 35 percent. Look at the top. It tells you. AW resource, how many findings? It was 31. None of them was for the S3. None of them was for the AIM. None of them was for the EC2. If you look at the top on the side, uh, Amazon guard duty looks up and tries to find anomaly work. Inspector looks at and inspects what the settings you have. Amazon Macy's actually is a DLP. Uh, AM access analyzer goes into the AM and once again checks your rights and your privileges. AWS firewalls or um, additional firewalls we can set. One of the things we talked about last week is Amazon Guard Duty looks for, it uses machine learning. If a user looks funny, it'll actually take that user and that IP, sends it to AWS firewall and block that user, right? So now we're using those products together, right? And that's what we're going to show too on some of the labs is how do you set that up and get it to the next level? And two, if you look at the what I cut off at the bottom, I'll cut it off. Uh, new findings over time by provider, new findings over time by severity, right? All findings are the same. Like they're usually cat ones, twos, and threes. Cat ones usually um, findings that are out in the wild and being attacked, right? So with this, you can come up with your score and the risk to your organization, right? Because when I talk to CISOs, CIOs, I haven't even talked to the board of directors, they want to know the risk to their organization. They really don't care about these numbers. How likely are they to get hacked, right? That's really what they want to know. So let me dig down in the, um, I'm brushing up on my net for, oh yeah, I struggle with that. And that's the first thing I'm I'm working on is part of AWS Control Tower. It, set up, it sets up your three tier. Um, and we're going to look at that too. The, it's weird. It looks like it's in two separate regions. It looks like it put my database tier in a whole totally different region when I was looking up AWS Control Tower. Um, I'm actually going to reach out to uh, Network Bruh um, he's one of the young guys that's uh, on networking. He's a Cisco guy. He's actually studying for one of the higher level Cisco uh, search. So I'm actually going to get with him, um, Citizen Lou, and be like, I need some help on my network. Well, I'm going to set it up and I'm going to work with him to make sure I thought about it. Because you're talking about cider blocks and the numbers and how big is your cider block range and what subnets can talk to uh, these subnets, right, with your route tables. <laughs> so I'm with you on that, Citizen Lou. <laughs> I'm a little perplexed. <laughs> How do you go about submitting proposals on Upwork? We can talk about that online. Um, you when you log on, usually they give you so many free connects on Upworks. You bid on it. The work, crazy thing is, man, you get you bid on people against people around the world. So I got this little blur. I'm Professor Black Ops. I'm the baddest man on the planet. I work with CISOs. I do big systems. I talk a lot of smack. I probably made before my mom died, probably two years ago, the year before that, I made fifteen thousand on Upwork Citizen Loop. So I begin trying to get the Upwork. I got to get back on that Upwork journey. The only problem is depending on what you're doing, Citizen Lou. I was trying to do Oracle programming. Man, them dudes from India and Africa was charging fifteen dollars an hour for Oracle programming. I'm like, dude, I don't open up my laptop for less than twenty. I sound elitist. <laughs> I, I don't open up my laptop for less than twenty, Citizen Lou. So I had to find. A niche inside Upwork, so I thought Oracle programming guys get paid. Nah, man, them dudes in India and Africa was eat that work up for pennies, man. I'm like, oh, I gotta figure out something. So I'm gonna throw it out there because you know we all cool. Uh, I charge about fifty dollars or seventy five out that seventy five dollars an hour to do uh government compliance work on Upworks. So we can we can get a uh, we can chop that up offline, Citizen Lou, and I I can uh show you my um my proposals how how I used to win stuff and um. So yeah, we could chop it up. I... <laughs> What's up, Destination Dad? I gotta get you on my channel, man. I know you're trying to grow. I'm interviewing people. Set up my interview list again. Does the ACA trigger use a scoring similar to CVS and does it compare vulnerabilities to national vulnerability? Is uh I will show you. I don't think it does CVS's because those are um those are known attacks. What what it does is 
if that known attack is super known, JM, it says this is the compliance I know is going to block that attack. Then it rates that compliance and not the actual attack. Uh, make, let me know if that makes sense, right? So see, the CVSs are known tax that are going on. I do compliance. What happens is every, every year those attacks, they come out with compliances that are block those attacks, right? So from a cybersecurity point of view, I do both of those, right? I do the compliance attack. Then I use some like Rapid7 or Titanium. They're going to look at current attacks out there. Then those, those current attacks, I got to figure out if I got a compliance that's blocking attack. A lot of times, though, JM, those CVSs are old attacks. I'm on the wrong version of Apache. I'm on the wrong version of Tomcat. I need to upgrade my version, and it's going to fix that attack, right? It's not what compliance I got. I'm The compliance check is I'm not on the current version of that support for that particular application, right? Apache, Tomcat, um, Oracle, they come out with updates. Oracle does quarterly. Microsoft is patched Tuesday, right? So a lot of those are, aren't um, compliance attacks from those vulnerabilities. The attack is I need to patch that OS and get to the uh, the current patch. Let me know if that makes sense, JM. What's up, Matt? It's glad you can join. Just kind of going through uh, AWS Control Tower. Uh, yeah, let me know, Citizen Lou. We, we can, uh, like I said, uh, send me an email, Citizen Lou, uh, professorblackops at gmail.com if you want to talk about that and we can get online on private and i could sh i show you my proposal or i might i'm not i'm not scared to hide them i might make a video of let me know if y'all want to see uh proposals of my upwork wins i got a lot of upwork losses though because <laughs> you be bidding against people around the world citizen Lou. it took me about three months to kind of figure out how to tailor my uh proposals to win um like i said it was it, it took me a while and i was surprised um uh citizen lou needed to see this live <laughs> cool you can check out the replay or you can always chime in but yeah so um uh <laughs> game over shout out to game over <laughs> so, yeah that makes sense Thank you. okay so yeah so on two is on our labs we'll talk about that we'll do a compliance and like you say we look for a cvs because if you look most of the cvs is uh update this version and you're good right a lot of time compliance is um like um what's the big bank they forgot to uh, lock down their S3 bucket and they had a ton of credit cards in the S3 bucket. It was open to the internet, right? That's a compliance check, right? That's a configuration that they messed up on, right? And cool, shout out to the uh, AWS advisor. It, it'll give you an email saying uh, that's open to the internet. Do you want it like that? For the digital mobile maps? Yeah, I'll do that. And I might get, um, I'll see if Tristan Lou want to join me. Yeah, I could do that because, yeah, that's good. I just kind of took that for granted. Like I said, uh, when my mom passed away, I just kind of um, just kind of hunkered down. I didn't want to do any extra side work for a while. I was kind of burnt out. I was doing uh, side work. I was teaching. I was working my regular job. I was trying to get my YouTube channel started up, you know. So I was <laughs> I was doing too much. So I got kind of burnt out. So I need to take a chill. So, yeah, I, I'll do that. And like I said, I'll get with um citizen lou because he's the um nomad he the one being uh mexico giving um mexico lesson latin giving us uh, spanish lessons so you can digital nomad i do that jam i put that on my list like i said i'll um, take some screenshots of some stuff i want and i can go through the um cyber stuff from uh um, compliance and i can look at the like i said i was surprised what they were charging for oracle developers even java developers man those guys Cause those Indian guys, man, uh, the dollar's so strong over there, man. They be charged, they be charging pennies to do stuff, man. And uh, the only cool thing too, and I tell people getting that federal life is you got to be on uh, U.S. soil to do federal work, right? Or Konos, continental United States, right? So that's one reason I do do government work is you you cut off a lot of your competition because you got to be in the United States to do federal work, right? Um. So that's the screen, right? So we do it in live and it gives you the score, right? CIS benchmarks is what checks do you have on this database on this EC2? And you passed 14, you failed 24, your score is 35%, which we could drill down into fail and it'll tell us what to fix. Um, from a cybersecurity perspective, shout out to uh, B2B and um, Citizen Lewis. I will work with them because some of the stuff I could set in CIS could break their app, right? 
So security and development's got to work together. Or DevSecOps, you know, when I set those things, they got to test it in uh, development to make sure I don't uh, break anything, right? So. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. No, you don't know because most of those guys is um, they're vendors trying to get into the government. Right. So the only thing which they never asked me <laughs> um, if I was them, I, I would do a I did have one do a been verified background check on me because you got to remember, I'm not working for the government. A lot of times it's, I'm helping these vendors get into the government. Right. They have their SA team. They have their support team. They have their development team on shore. They have all their infrastructure. They just don't, this screen right here, they just don't know how to do this to pass Fed ramp compliance or HIPAA compliance or FERPA compliance or, you know, there's so many compliances. I got to help them pass this. So when they turn it over to the CISO, they're going to ask for their security plan, their vulnerabilities, their uh, agile development plan, right? We were talking about pipeline. So, Especially if you live been listening to Biden, he's been talking about a zero trust for the government. All oh, that's part of zero trust is how is your security program working so you can do work for the government? But no, I, you don't have to have a security clearance. Um, to be honest, which I'm surprised, I only had I probably done twenty assignments on uh, Upworks. I've only had one guy do a background check on me. Um, like I said, I'm just really giving them advice. I usually don't log into their system. If I do, I usually just have view access. I usually just have their developers give me assessments I need to do this sheet right here that we're looking at, right? So those CIS benchmarks, I usually give them in spreadsheets, right? So I'm going to give some to their web team, their database team, who's ever in charge of their EC2. Are we Windows 2016, 2019? I got checks for each one. Linux, I'm a Red Hat guy. Here the red hat check. So, and those checks are going to give me a score right there. So I'm trying to get their score up to 70 or 80 percent. So we can do that. Nope. Nope. Because you got to remember, I'm not I'm not working for the government. I'm helping the vendor do work for the government, right? So usually after this, I train their vendors, their their I train their company up. So usually they don't need me after a couple of years. Cause really, I'm just once I get you up to 70 percent, you know what those checks are. Right. You, you know what you need to do. Then shut out to jam. Then you just need to do your um, titanium or rapid seven so you can make sure those CVEs when they come in. Basically, is that check is you need to be up to date on all software, because if you're not, that's where those CVX checks come in. Nine times out of ten is the vendor's going to fix them. So you just need to be you need to be up. Your patch Tuesday needs to be tight. Right. And once again, we're talking about the governance, uh, this cybersecurity framework, kind of what we were looking at. Uh, you can, the customer, you want to enable additional policies for regions, AWS config, implement detective guardrails. We were looking at that on the uh, sheet. We also always checking our Amazon S3 buckets, Amazon config to implement detective guardrails to automatically enable AWS config. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. It's called a conformance. A conformance pact at the top. So from the conformance pact, it's AWS Convict provides predefined customized rules to value whether your AWS resource complies to best practices. You can also create your own customer rules pack by AWS Lambda functions, which can contain logic that evaluates the AWS resources complies with rules. Because the logic is defined in the AWS function, you can implement any security control you like as long as you can put logic into code right so aws lambda let's be real specific it's code when the uh control tower runs this code uh puts a server underneath and the m the aws lambda check would be like go check this um unix thing to make sure the disk is encryption right so you can set those individual controls into uh custom rules right the crazy thing is they have so many rules. It's going to take you a while before you need custom rules. And we're going to look at a few of those. Remediation action in in AWS Config, you can use system manager automation documents to apply remediation to non-compliant resources that are evaluated by AWS Config rules. You can also create custom, like we just looked at automation documents for custom remediation. 
and associate them with AWS config rules. When you create your conformance pack, it's a best practice to set remediation actions for your rules. You can set up automatic remediation that would take place as soon as the resource become non-compliant or a manual remediation will be performed by your security team, right? So some reason somebody took a database and took encryption off, right? I could say, hey, if they take the um, encryption off of Oracle, automatically put it back in, right? Or if they took it off, send an email to the security team, and we gotta go see why they're taking that off, right? It could be too that for some reason this happened is, um, they took a cipher off on a web server and when that web server would connect to the database that cipher wasn't on there right and it got confused right and it wouldn't connect right so there's reasons why you would do it so we're gonna look at this one right here uh customized performance package we were looking at that cis benchmark you can do hip and other things there are two types of uh, sample uh conformance packs we were talking about that is um Operations, shout out to um, B2B and Citizen Lou. They're going to be more worried about operations, all right? I'm going to be worried about compliance, right? So we got to make sure we understand what these checks are doing to to the uh, environment, right? Because I'm nine times out of 10, I'm going to be doing conform, uh, compliance checks, and they're going to be doing operational checks, right? and use the CI, CDI pipeline, automate deployment and management of the performance packs. To create a performance packs in YAML template contains a list of configs. It's essential infrastructure as code. The best practices for managing infrastructure as a code is to automate a pipeline that, it can do, that includes continuous integration and continuous deployment. All right, you store your template in the source control platform, review the code updates and then validate tests and deploy them. You can also use the pipeline for peer review, validate, and update your stuff. Like when I start putting those on there, we got to do those in development because some of those checks could break the app, right? Depending on how old that app is and how they're moving, right? So that's how we want to automate it and keep, you know, setting up, right? So here's some of the conformance packs. Once again, I'm usually here in the NIST 800 dash world. Um, that's really federal compliance. That's FedRAMP too. Um, FedRAMP is just NIST in the cloud. Um, CMC is super popular, CIS is super popular. So I put some of the most, mostly highly used stuff that is going to be in, in government work, right? Uh, so that shows you the cloud formation, which, which are those rules, how to get them into the pipeline. Down the bottom is CloudWatch automation too. And we're going to do some labs where you actually see this in real life. So. Um, uh, this is Citizens Lou part. If he's still on, or we probably get back. AWS control manage environment if required to corporate offices, on-prem data centers, and a wide area network. You can use the AWS Transit Gateway to connect your VPC and on-prem network with a single gateway. You need to be able to scale your network across multiple accounts and VPCs when the number of your workloads on your AWS grows. Transient gateways act as a hub that controls how traffic is routed among connected networks. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, Amazon VPC Proud Cloud Network. Connectivity operations, depending on your current network design and requirements. These connectivity options include using either the internet or the AWS Direct Connect as a network backbone and ending your connection to AWS or your user management network endpoints. What's up, Bose? Glad you can join us. So this is the part I've been looking at too, is when you collect, when you click on AWS tower, it's gonna create your networking, right? That you're gonna put all your network resources in and how do they connect to your on-prem network, right? So one of the first ones is, is a standard three-tier network, right? You got the zero, one, two, right? So I'm assuming that. Top one is the web application. This is your application and your bottom will be your database, right? So uh, I'm a, a Linux guy, so it'll be Amazon Linux. I'll be running my Apache, my Tomcat. I'm old school, so I'm gonna run Oracle as my database, right? So then it's gonna go out your AWS Direct Connect Gateway to your AWS router, to your customer router, to your customer site. So we talked about creating users. So when you create your users, 
right? This is the path it's going to take. The thing it's going to validate is your Active Directory. I should put Active Directory. It's going to sync up here to your AWS SSO. That's going to give you permissions to be able to set it up, who goes where and who can get to what. But this right here is your networking from a startup standpoint and from your base skeleton, right? So it's going to give you, I'm assuming this, uh, and I'm going to do this in real life. And like I said, I'm going to give you the cloud formation script. This should be your one open to your um, internet. So it have your internet gateway in there. Then your, which will have your Apache, which is going to be open to the internet. Your um, Tomcat is going to be private and your database is going to be private network. If somebody in my corporate needs to work on it, they're going to VPN up into this resource, right? Not from the internet. They get to my VPN through my gateway and be able to work on the Amazon or Apache or the Oracle database, right? Because you got to let somebody be able to work on it, right? Even though it's not open to the internet, you got to work on it. So. Hopefully not much, right? Because we're going to be running um, those AWS cloud services. So hopefully Amazon is going to be doing most of the work on them. But do your um, on-prem staff is going to need a bit to get to them. Does the B, does the VPN use IPsec or another set on, or on, or another more secure protocol? Um, that's a good question. On this one, I would actually use. Uh, VPN as a more secure protocol. Um, I wouldn't set up an IPsec on this setup, but I'm glad you mentioned that. That's going to roll in our, to our, net, our next one, JM. This one right here, because of the transient gateway and how they work, I might use a VPN from here to get to the uh, transient gateway because I don't think those are as secure as going to the uh, direct connect gateway. This adds, uh, makes it easier to communicate between the VPCs on there. I think that's why they added. So this one right here, I probably would do IPsec, but um, IPsec is usually what a used for Windows. I, I usually run more Linux. So um, I'm going to have my man network, um, bro, coming. I'm going to do a, a VPN tunnel, but it's going to be from his Cisco router here up to the transient gateway. So I would do the, I'm going to have the CP. I'm sorry, I'm going to have Cisco do the, their VPN firewall. I wouldn't do the IPsec uh, firewall, JM, to be honest on that. And I'm actually going to get some network guys on it. <laughs> like uh, Citizen Lou, that's not my strong point, <laughs> I'm going to put that out there. That's not my strong point. So I'm going to get that validated by a few people. So, But me and Network, bro, he actually has hardware in his house. So I was, I was going to have him set this up in his house on his um, Cisco um, Connect to my uh, AWS tower. And one, I was going to use the Cisco firewall. And then the other one, like you said, I was going to do some Windows work and set up an IPsec firewall. Two is I might do both. You can actually have firewalls inside firewalls. That could be a performance hit. But from a security um, thing, JM, I like those multiple levels. So I can run an IPsec firewall inside of a Cisco VPN firewall. So we're actually going to uh, dig down a little more into that coming up, to be honest. Um, uh, Jam, I'm going to uh, use some of my contacts and bring in some of my networking guys so I can make sure I'm setting it up right. Here's the, another one with one transit gateway with all the VPCs communicating with each other, going through a VPN connection, right? So that VPN could be uh, Cisco going to transit, IPsec. Right? Um, usually when I do VPN tunnel, uh, I usually use Cisco, Jam, because that's what they do. They're the 800-pound gorilla. In, in the realm into that organization. So um, let me know, Jam, if you want to dig into that. I got some resources that gonna come on my channel for my work and they actually uh, cook Azure and uh, AWS in real life. So I'm actually good with those guys. I, I might have them come on my channel and actually talk about that, Jam. Like I said, I, don't, I review it from a security perspective, but I trust those guys. So when I scan them, as long as... Um, it says the envelope is encrypted as long as it's AES 258 or higher, and long as they got the fit st static button coming on from a security chat. That's what I look for, JM. So let's see. This is another one. If you're not using on prem and you're just using different uh, VPC regions, you can go to a transit gateway so they can communicate to each other. My thing is, if they're on the same region, why would I use a, a transit gateway? So. Um, like I said, I'm a little weak in that. 
So um, check out Network, bruh. Um, check out um, – I'm going to do a little something over here, and like I said, I can dig into it. Uh, Network, bruh, he does um, Cisco Labs. Uh, he's studying for a higher level Cisco, so he took a couple months off. But he actually goes through um, networking – Cisco networking labs on his channel. What I would do is – we would joke is I would bring him a security check to make sure he was – he was doing it on on that part of whatever he was uh, labbing. He was doing today, like he was doing a VPN tunnel. He was what was he? He was doing uh, RC four communications. So I would look up the RC four federal checks, and I would send him one check, and we would look it up inside of his Cisco router to see if he was doing that jam. So I just file back on network, bro. But I'll do some here. But he actually does, and, and even though he's not uh, producing content. He did network labs for two years for different certifications on his channel. His name is Network Bruh. So um, I usually go to his channel too to uh, help me, even though I've been in the game for 30 years. I just don't do a lot of networking. And from, from a compliance standpoint, um, that's just one segment of the overall you know things I review. It's very important though, because if the networking is messed up, right, everything's going to be messed up. But like I said, I'm definitely gonna probably have him on my channel, you know, to talk about that and assist. And I give him a couple of weeks heads up to study because some of the stuff I understand compliance. I just never let me look up some real quick. I just never uh, done some of that. Um, like I said, in real life for that particular part. See. Let's look at one of the compliances real quick. Okay, let's look at here. So when we looked at those conformance, um, conformance packets, well, I can't even say it right. Oh, there it was. That's it. I wish I should make that bigger, but we're just going to go with it. So when we talk about NIST 800-53, what does that mean, right? When you talk about packets and you're talking about doing that from a security perspective, what does that mean? All right, so if we looked at this is NIST 800-53, revision 5. So when we talk about compliance check, right, it says NIST 800-53 with the AWS managed config rules. These are some of the rules. Right, AC, if he looks out there, access control, specify authorized user of a system, uh, personal termination and transfer process. Right, so it says the guidance here identifies credentials are used, managed, and verified based on the organization IAM policy, password policy. That's what um, Citizen Lou was talking about in the AIM screen. Meets or see the requirements stated by NIST 800-63. NIST 800-63 gives you the policy, how long the password should be, when you should use MFA, right? So then it tells you the rules allow to optionally set required uppercase characters, right? The value set to true, required lowercase uh, value set to true, requires symbols true, requires numbers true maximum password length foundation is 14 right so people hate me because when you do federal if you're not doing mfa your password's got to be 14 or bigger right so this conformance pack what we're talking about is making sure the iam password is set up for nist or government uh federal work so part of them is minimum password length best practices value 14. password reuse prevention uh best practice is it's going to check your last 24 values can't be equal to each other the max the max password age and value is can't be uh it's 90 days after 90 days you got to change your password for your password policy the actual values should reflect your organizational policy right so these are the base settings but we can go in and change them right so 90 is cool for nist i do um it's called distance stigs right Therefore, federal DOD compliant. It's not 90, it's 60 days. So I would go on those that 90 and change it to 60. So every 60 days, you got to create a new password. And I'm going to check the 24, right? It can't be known of the last 24 you used. And your password has to be length of 14. The, the thing I, I got to figure out is, okay, best practice 14. But if you use an MFA, I can let your length be eight, right? And you could be one, one, and one. 
So I got to figure out how to programmatically check if this user is using MFA, right? I think that's where we use the one. Thanks, she glad you joined me. We can wrap up in a minute, but thanks for coming through. So, so now I got to figure out, okay, how to check for the password. I got to check that. But it's, if it's MFA, it's something different. So is there somewhere on the conformance I could put an and, right? So those are some of the stuff we're going to figure out when we actually do it in real life. Uh, two is each one of these are NIST 800-53, like we're talking about rules, right? Are we going to make it mandatory? We're going to do guidance, so we're going to do prevention, right? So these are some of the built-in checks, right? Um, and so you got to remember, though, this is for the part that Amazon controls. If you spin up your own Apache, your own, what you're responsible for, right? So now I got to figure out how to do the conformance pack with stuff you spin up that you control, right? Because it's a shared responsibility. Do you have public web service to post all your classes, PowerPoints, and resources? I do. And if you want me to start doing that, JM, I, I do have a Google uh, Drive. I only usually put stuff when people ask me to do stuff out there, but I can put those out there on that public uh, website, JM. Let me know if you want to. I, I don't have a problem doing that. Password reuse prevention sounds like a group policy. It is when it's on prem boils. We're spinning this stuff up in Amazon. So you're correct. This is Amazon's version of a group policy, right? Because when I spin up Amazon, Amazon SSO is going to be handling uh, a lot of those um, things. But you're right. If I spin up my own web server um, and it's uh, Windows 2019, I will be responsible for that GPO. So I need to get this compliance check to check my GPO. If I spin up an AM resource that the AWS SSO is in control, then they're control. So basically, I'm actually going to need both of those because I know I'm going to spin up a few of my own web servers, Boyle. So you are correct. I will have a GPO policy with that in there, and I would actually have the AWS SSO policy. So I would need those to work together. Because a lot of the time in your EC2, when I spin up on Windows 2019, I, I can actually have it use the AWS SSO for author, authorization and uh, authentication and authorization, boys. But I need to check that out. You are correct. Uh, on prem, but once you spin it up in the cloud, right, Amazon takes over a lot of that uh, group policy work inside uh, AWS SSO. Yeah, I can do that, JM. Um, come back to this and then go to the bottom. I have the um, I have the Google Drive in there at the bottom. So give me an hour. Come back here in this description. I have the the Google Drive link, and when you go on there, it it'll, it'll have the um, it'll have all the um, slideshows. I'm just thinking. I think I just caught them week one, week two, week three. So let me, let me look at that, JM. I might need to create some sub folders and give you a, a couple of them because I don't I don't think I named them appropriately now that you're asking for that, JM. So give me a couple of days for that, JM. If I don't hit you back, hit me up at uh, professorblackops at gmail.com. Yeah, so no, that was a great question, boy. So like you said, we got to get that working together with AWS and uh, uh, and uh, on-prem. On-prem, 100%. Uh, like I said, when you go up in AWS, depending on who's controlling it, uh, AWS SSO, uh, look at these uh, rules. But if you're controlling it, right, you can spin up your own Windows servers and controlling it. I don't want to do that because now I got to look in two places. And But I'm actually going to do that to see how that would work, uh, boys, to get that to um, do those cross checks. Like if I'm controlling my own those Windows 19 and I put the GPOs on there, how do I get the uh, conformance pack from Tower to look at? the on stuff AWS control and also get it the stuff that uh I'm controlling that because I'm I want it on one dashboard. So that's some of the things I, I need to dig into the AWS tower to figure out how that would work. Right. I work with a few guys that actually do that from other agencies. So I'm gonna reach out to them to figure out what does that look like. But that's it fellas. So you see the operational NIST 800 S 53s. These are the rules. We we gonna put those in as part of AWS Tower, remember the conformance pack. Then when we spin it up, a lot of this stuff is built in, right? We go to the dashboard, it's gonna tell us what passed, what's not, right? Then we can fix it or not fix it, right? But it gives us a score and that score tells us the risk of our organization that we set up inside AWS Tower or AWS itself, right? So when you talk to management, if you had a 35%, you're like, 
Yeah, boss, we about to get hacked next week, man. No, I'm just playing, right? But it tells you where you're at in your organization. And the cool thing, too, is when we looked at that dashboard, uh, it tells you 35, and then it tells you what was not conforming. So you can drill down in there to see what you need to fix, right? And two is what we need to fix, right? We're going to get out. Shout out to uh, Citizen Lou, B2B. That's the stuff you're going to get to the development team and the DevOps team to fix, right? Because cybersecurity, we don't fix that stuff, right? From compliance. These are the stuff we fix, and you need to get this fixed. That's why your score is low, right? Then they're going to put that in their, their agile system, their CDI pipeline, uh, and their backlog, right? That's going to give them – you're welcome, uh, Game Over. That's going to give you – tell you your workload and how you need to fix it. And two is, depending on what it is, my boss might ask, time is money. How long is it going to take? Oh, we can take their bill right in their FTE, come up with a dollar amount for that, or we might need to go buy something else, right? One of those checks could be a, a big ticket dollar item. So we could take those items too and put time and money to them, right? From a compliance standpoint. And that's really what management cares about. Management really doesn't care that the password is, you know, is 60 or 90. They want to know, okay, if you can't put it on, how risky is that? Uh, do we need to buy something else? Is there some other component we need to buy, right? Or are we trying to buy a metric to encrypt, you know, the disk on the fly, right? So, so these are the stuff that if you can't do right, that's going to give you a score. We can give this to developers. They can put some time on it, right? Because agile, you know, you get just your sticky your requirements, your sprints. You put them in your sprints. Your sprints going to give you a dollar amount uh, if you need to buy something too. So you get a time and a dollar amount. The two is there's going to be some low hanging fruit you can knock out in the first week. Some of that stuff I, I had teams tell hey, we need a whole year to fix this, right? So uh, once again, you get that to your team. Your DevOps team, your SecOps teams, your development team, uh, put money to it. And, you know, that's how you come up with how much that's going to cost you as an organization. And that's kind of what I what I what I help people with. Two, what I'll do is I'll set up. A, um, what did he call that? I like that term he used. Nomad, digital nomad. I set up a digital nomad screen and we'll talk about what I do for because um, I'm just about to get back into it. I've just been kind of burnt out what i do on upworks to win work what kind of work i thought i was gonna make money on and i was like man this is too many people out here this is how i make money from this particular like i said i do more compliance and stuff um we could go out there and look at c sharp rates uh java rates uh dev ops shout out to tim and women in linux uh shout out to black heights you know they talk about the money but i do a um I'll do a um a nomad screen a no a nomad um sh uh, stream management should understand that it. it's so easy to crack passwords. <laughs> no, they they're pretty good with that. You're right, but the part of that um uh, even if they're not jam, that's our responsibility, right? I get on my CISO. He's coming on my show. Sh shout out, he's Asian. We we get work together. Is you got to convey that to management and convince them sometime, right? You got to convey that to the board of directors, right? So a lot of things you take for granted, they're like, hey, well, this Fortune 500 company been doing that forever. I'm like, they about to get hacked. So and I think that's where the uh, soft skills come in, Jam, where you talk to management and put it in uh, regular terms, money terms, hours terms, dollar terms. That's really what management gets, right? A lot of times they don't even know what, I promise you, um, my boss, probably the CISO, doesn't know what Jack the Ripper is, man. He came from physical security. Excellent manager, came from NSA, handles budgets, understands uh, coop business. He'd be learning, but that's super specific from a management term, JM. Jack the Ripper. Now I do because I'm about that life, but most most manage most managers, they, you know, they I don't think they're gonna know what that is, JM. Right, so how come cybersecurity never talks about cryptography using mathematical equation? systems and messages um the reason why and that's a good question is very few people do i don't do it because um they tell you what products meet that meet cryptical cryptography and the mathematics of that right if i buy this product it's called fips 140-2 engineering cannabis the government's already signed on off on that they had their cryptography special that looks at it they said it's good. So when I use Oracle FIPS 140 FIPS 140-2, it's good. Their cryptography for the government already already vetted it. I don't need to understand it. 
and I I know what it is. Engineering cannabis, it's a it's a big mathematical formula. To be honest, I don't care. I just need to know it's encrypted, right? Right. When I use um, we talk about a GPG or or PGP, which is about five thousand dollars a server. It's approved by the government. It gives me the command. It's gonna encrypt my file. And I'm good, right? So we talk about it from a FIS 140-2 because it's so complicated. Engineering cannabis, the government tells you to send it to them, and they're gonna make sure it's good. Right, so it's gonna be AES two fifty six or higher. It's gonna be FIS one forty two from a compliance standpoint. The government says I'm good, so that's why I don't think you hear people talk about it. the software feel a material play a role in your day to day, or just when you're choosing new software. For me, it doesn't play a, a role in it uh, because the business is gonna pick the software for me, Tam. Uh, Tammy, uh, the business picked the software. They know the price. They're going to get a pitch about because they're looking at it from a functionality standpoint. Uh, so I, I don't care how much they pay for it. That's all they have, right? So if they get approval for it, what I do, what I care about is any software comes into the agency I work for, the security team reviews it. So we work with the vendor before they buy anything. We'll work with the vendor and say, hey, uh, we need to review it. Like my man, uh, Engineering Cannabis says, is your encryption FIPS 140-2? What's your life cycle? Um, what servers are you using? If you're an AWS, are you like we just talked about, are you using this architecture? Are you using these services to make sure you're secure? Are you using this Red 5? You got the compliance checked on because I need all these checks on this because you're selling to the government, right? So the bills of material doesn't play. Like I said, for me, because security, if you got the money for it, I'm cool. It comes into play as I got to do a security review of it. So, um, and the cool part about it of, of it is too is is um, I users because we we don't rejected so many software as time is I users know what they need to ask the vendor for right? Are you Fed Ramp approved? Are you NIST eight hundred fifty three approved? Because depending on how deep they're in our organization, I might ask for a system security plan and the checks we were looking at here. All these got to be completed. And most um, bigger organizations, they already know that. They got, they've got they done government work. They've been in that government life. So they know their products got to use this and be this. And the password's got to be that. And they got to hook it up into our active directory. And, um, and two is we're going to harden our servers a certain way. So they got to make sure their software can run on our hardened servers, Tammy. So uh, most of those guys know that because they've been in that um, – that federal life. And uh, I've been thinking about switching over to sales because I help a lot of vendors get in our organizations a little bit. They struggle a little bit sometimes with that. Boy, it was kind of a study. Bitcoin, white paper, mathematical flips, your above engineering. Oh, shout out to that. <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm hanging around for it. Uh, I'll drop the link if anybody wants to come up. I'm just chopping it up. Um, like I said, I'm great. Get back to my... Um, AWS studying. Um, so, so yeah, so that, that's kind of it. Um, I just want to talk about AWS control tower, kind of like at a high level. That's the blueprint. So if you spark something new, you want to use that blueprint. And I want to talk about the GRC, what things in AWS you need to look at. Um, obviously, the, um, the conformance package, because it had all the... Um, compliances in there cmc oracle and tools when you hook it on you get a lot of that stuff out of the box ready to go right so your infrastructure is already set up to um to run with uh government work right so and uh, like i said i'm gonna do a nomad stream i need to write that down i'll find my my little things with all i need to uh, write on so um, but yeah we, we could talk about that um um it, it's interesting and uh my man asked me, do they drug test me? No, nah, because a lot of times, once again, you usually get uh, small vendors trying to do government work. So once they got in there, a lot of times somebody start asking them for a system security plan or uh, is, is your app NIST 800 53 compliant or verify? So then that's when they reach out on um, Upworks and trying to figure out what, <laughs> what are these guys talking about, right? So, like I said, that's kind of it in a high level. Like I said, um, we're going to actually start 
labbing on this in real life too, you know, so we can actually see what it looks like. Um, we did screenshots. We saw the um, the thirty five percent. That's all the checks they had completed for that particular um, compliance. So we we can dig down into that and um, dig into it more. But like I said, I'm gonna just dip your toe into it. Like I said, it's kind of like an introductory channel talking about different um, phases of cybersecurity. We probably start intro to uh, basic forensics class here in a couple of weeks. Um, those are kind of three ones I'll do AWS, um, security plus intro. I did the 500. I need to upgrade it to the 601 class and the forensics class. So I don't know, JM. I'm just staying with AWS, man. It's too much. <laughs> I don't know, man. I think I'm gonna stay on the AWS train for a little bit. I do a little Azure work. There are a lot of overlap. It's just I'm trying to focus, JM. There's a lot. <laughs> and two is once you start doing Azure, I know guys that are good in both of them. They say when they took the text, they start mixing terms. So I <laughs> so I don't I don't think I'm gonna do a lot of Azure in Azure. Um, from that, I might change my mind. I, I don't I don't think so, JM. I'm trying to. I'm trying to pick something and ride that horse out to JM. I, I think it's good. And shout out to Tam. She's 100% right. I think um, multi-cloud is going to make you better. I think multi-cloud is the future, especially when uh, AWS went out a couple of times. I think Azure went out a couple of times. So I think people are going to have stuff in both. Um, I'm just trying to master one before I, before I try to go to multi cloud JM. So I think I'm still AWS at least for a year, man. So I don't think I'm gonna do much with Azure. Um, the only thing I might do with, with Azure is um talk about um Office 365. I think a lot of people take their for granted. I do a lot of compliance work, and I did a lot of work with the IRS, and they gave specific checks for. Azure Office 365, you know, that's the email, Teams, that. So I might talk about that as an office thing from a security, but I don't think I'm going to get down into the individual VPC part of that and the networking and how all that goes. JM, I'm just trying to focus on <laughs> Azure. How you doing, Erica? Glad you could make it. I'm kind of wrapping up, though, but I'm glad you can make it. But So that's it. So, yeah, so... um. Once again, re, uh, just check the playback if you got any questions. Jam, I'll look at those slides. I might have to uh, rename them and clean them up a little bit because I think I got week one, two, and three. So I might need to pick the, uh, like I said, be a little more descriptive of actually what I was talking on that. So um, let me see. I think that's all I got. Um, let me robe. That's all. I think that's all I got. If y'all don't have any more questions, um, I think I'm. A, let's see. Oh, you got to go for another two. <laughs> that's a no, Erica. <laughs> that's B two B stuff on there. <laughs> Shout out to B two B. You're gonna have to check the replay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm thinking about, you know, I think the longest I ever went for me, myself, I think it's probably two hours and a half. I've been on a B2B. Uh, that's my man. That's my young guy. He's been on a 30-hour live. I think I was on it for four hours and I was dozing off. Uh, I was interviewed for three hours on Alpha Cyber Channel. And it, that was flying. We went three hours and they were asking us to go to another hour. His wife told us we had to shut it down. Shout out to the queen. <laughs> so uh, I've been, oh, um, I take that back. Um Miss B Finesse, I was on her show for four hours. So yeah, I, uh, if you bored, there's a um, if you check my channel, I have a, a playlist for all the times I got interviewed. So yeah, there's uh, the four hours on there for Miss B Finesse. Uh, Alpha Cyber, I got interviewed for three hours. <laughs> so what questions you got? <laughs> so um, once again, Control Towers, the blueprint, um, best practices of everything, and uh aws is learning for customers they try to put it in the blueprint and the best practices so when i spin up um this in a couple of weeks hopefully like i said i'm gonna set up some labs so we can actually do it in real life and uh, uh like jm um i might need to bring in some networking help the cool thing is you just kind of pick which networking you want to do and it spins it up for you which 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 helps a lot if you don't have a um 
a networking staff or connected because when you start talking about ciders and <laughs> cider doing that mathematics right that stuff i don't do anymore right i'll uh, i'll just spin that up so boy, <laughs> busy you always busy you the role model eric so um so that's it so um that's all i want so i dropped the link uh, i want everybody to have a nice weekend we just getting out of the short snowstorm i'm in Indiana. my car was stuck so i had to get it unstuck yesterday so i was I was a little grumpy and tired, but I got it out. It's, the sun is out. All the snow melting, but I was a rough couple of days in, in Indiana. So um, I'll get those out, JM. If I'm not if I, uh, a little late, just ping me. <laughs> I'll be, I be trying to be like Erica. I'll be busy. I've been studying and freelancing and working and working on my YouTube channel, trying to get it to the next level, hopefully getting some lives. I'm actually going to spin up a learning management system this summer. So you can actually, uh, I have quizzes and stuff out there you can take if you want to, um, you know, study for some. So that's my, they got, I think they got a new one. I'm using that old one. I need to go check it out. So yeah, I'm going to spin up a little uh, new learning platform. I need to go check it out. Like I said, I was, uh, they got free uh, class for AWS practitioner. So I use that. I don't know if that's the new one or the old one. So I've been doing it for about a couple months for the AWS practitioner. I need to. I think I did take that. Now you mentioned it. I take. I think I did take that because the AWS practitioner took me to that one. I need to go find that one now that you um you mentioned that to me, Erica. Erica, be on the for the class. Enjoy your son. I appreciate it. I'm about to shut it on down. Erica's coming up. Erica's coming up. Hey, how you doing? Can you hear me? I'm good. Don't leave me. I just joined. You got I need some of your commentary. You're gonna have to check me out on the replay. <laughs> then, we, then we can chat uh, up the replay. <laughs> is I'm, it that football stuff that they still say is going on? I I did it. I, I just did it at three. Through football or not. I took actually okay. So yeah, I just said, uh, you know, I I was surprised. Shout out to my, I appreciate everybody because I was doing the football. I I thought I was gonna have three people and everybody's gonna check it on the live. So I just said I'm gonna do every Sunday at three. That's the commitment to y'all, my channel. So every uh, Sunday at three p.m. Eastern, I'm coming on Super Bowl, whatever. I'm coming on. I'm coming on. I appreciate that's it, boy. So yeah. Well, so I won't it. hold you. I just didn't want you. I didn't want you to leave yet. So. Anyway, I'm <laughs> No, you, you are good. Just check out my replay. If you always got any questions, we can uh get together one on one, chop it up. I mean, you you yeah. you you up on top of. But if you have something specific, just check the replay out and just hit me up on professorblackops at gmail.com and we could do it private or hell. We might make a live out of it. Just you got questions, so somebody else might have questions. So yeah, I'm, I'm I'm here to help. But yeah, just check it out and uh, we chop it up. I'm going to do the um digital nomad. I told people I'd be uh freelancing on um. Upworks, they wanted me to talk about it for the digital nomads. I Meaning you could be anywhere and do freelance work. So I tell them I was gonna do that That's next problem. Probably. probably in a week. Give yeah. me a week. And AWS too, they have the their IQ bar where you can actually make money. Like they have like different products. You fed it out a little bit. Oh, she got a bad connection. I did not see that. Uh uh, I need to get back. I, I've been doing a little more real estate. Shout out to Kev Tech. I need to get I need to get back more in the stock. So yeah, I need to well, check out I need to check that out because I think I did one to be honest. One of their projects. I'm sorry, my internet went out. I had my hmm. um stream on, but my internet went out. One of the projects they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so was, you can bid on them. Yeah, I need to check that out because I was doing one of the um I was doing one of the ones free. They did send me the one where they had tests and questions. So I, I was going to start doing that right now. Like I said, um, I've just been studying because I ain't took a certain two years. So I was going to take the practitioner, kind of warm me up. That I was going to do. Maybe. No. I mean, the only way you should take, the only reason why you should take the practitioner is because mm -hmm. once you pass that, and I think everybody must pass that, once you pass that, you will get 50% off your next test. So mm -hmm. it will be a strategic move if you take mm -hmm. the practitioner. Uh -huh. practitioner but other than that you don't need a practitioner and i know for me no you're right i just 
I'm just so old. I ain't took a cert test. I ain't about 15 years. So I like study is okay. difficult when you study is difficult when you are. So I just did it kind of, you know, knock the rush off, rust off. So um yeah. But in the study for the practitioner, all you need is that front page of the um AWS website, the one where they just tell you about their services. If you mm -hmm. just know that one, two sentences about each service, you can pass the practitioner. It's okay. very like that. It's really just definition. That's cool. Well, sir, I'm not going to hold your life up. I'm going to let you go. But I just I'm, I'm driving right now, and I can't type as fast as I want to. So I <laughs> be said, safe. I'm just going to call in. Yes. No, that's All good. Right. So I, was I need you to be one. safe. I'll be, on time. I'll be on time next weekend. Yeah, you good. Uh, like I said, I'm Sunday at 3. Unless I'm sick, I don't, I don't care if it's the Super Bowl, whatever, I'm coming on. Like I said, shout out to my father. I was surprised I got this many people doing football season. I just said I'm coming on Sunday at 3. Um so I just I just come on Sunday at three. <laughs> so that's it. But two, check the replay. If you got something specific you want to chop it up about, just let me know. And two is I'm, a, I'm a, this this is gonna be the first one I'm gonna do a lab on is the control panel. I'm sorry, the control tower. So I email you. You never email me back. So I'm not emailing you no more. So you don't have to. Professor Blackout. No, I no. surely did. I need Whatever you to do that again. About, no, you need to send that to me because. You won't step on my feelings again. I emailed nah, you like, email yeah, me again. And you nah, was like, nothing. Okay. Nah, email me again. Professor Black Ops at gmail.com. Whatever I copied. I'm, I'm really good with the control C, control V, and whatever uh, I copied and paste, that's what I got. But it's okay, black man. Nah, 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 right. nah, nah. I, I owed you that. So if I didn't do it, let me uh do me a favor. When you, I'm going to put my email at the bottom of the. Uh, of this description of this one, because now nah, I, I I feel like I'm I'm not doing my part. So now nah, let me know because I'm trying. So let me put it back in there. I fail sometimes, Erica. I'm not perfect. I fail sometimes. So <laughs> what I'm telling you, know, like is, to talk about holding people accountable. So yeah, okay. facts. yeah, you gotta hold me accountable. So I'm gonna put it in. Maybe I didn't type it right. You know, I'm I'm talking and typing. You know, sometimes I miss a I miss an R or something. Let me work with you though. So that I, I want to be held accountable. So I'm gonna put it in at the bottom of the description. So uh, just All hit right. me up. So, but yeah, definitely email me. So let, yeah, definitely hold me accountable. Awesome. Well, again, you're doing a great job. Congratulations on everything, Black Man. I appreciate that. But hold me accountable. I need that. I'm getting old as an old man. I need that. I be mm -hmm. forgetting sometime. Help me out. Help me out. Help me out. You're fine. Okay. All, right, All the best, sir. Bye-bye. Okay. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Uh, yeah, um... Helmet, I've been like, I've been doing too much real estate. I'm going to throw that out there. Shout out to Kev Tech. I'm, I've been doing way too much real estate lately. So my stock game been a little low lately. Um, So I'm going to try and make a few moves here and there. Um, Shout out to uh Black Heights. He just, he just did a stream on these seven passive incomes. I'm sure when I'm real estate, I haven't looked at it yet. Um. So go check him out. I'm sure one of his ones are going to be a uh, real estate on that. Like I said, I've been dipping my toe into the real estate game. I'm trying to get a little more professional at it. But once again, shout out to AWS Control Tower. That's the blueprint. A AWS took all their thousands and thousands of customers and they came up with this as the best practices blueprint of how to uh, roll out an AWS installation. Um one of the big clients I'm working on, they actually uh, doing a proof of concept of this, and they're they're struggling, a, they're struggling a little bit of that. So um, I'm gonna bring a couple of those guys on and break down the, uh, especially um, shout out to my man, talk about the VPC and get a JM get a feel for that uh, VPC. I'm out, y'all. Everybody have a nice weekend. The well, weekend's over. Monday's here. <laughs> yeah it's weird it's weird for me eric when i hear my voice sometime on a replay i'll be like is that me it's weird especially just getting used to my voice on even though i've been doing this for a year because when i teach i never heard myself when I, I just hear hear me talking i never heard the replay of me so it's you hear my voice is a little hearing your voice is a little different but uh hold me accountable eric because i definitely want to make sure i'm um giving you what you need from the email game that's what I come here. And I really enjoy when you come on my channel too, because obviously, you know, you pass a lot of tests and you got a lot of offer to this game. 
Uh, soon, engineering cannabis. We we will do that soon. I need to start interviewing people uh, back on my channel. So you definitely be one of the uh, people I start with. It'd be this month, engineering cannabis. So I I reach out to you and set set up a time because I definitely uh, enjoy those those AIs, um, blockchain um, perspective, and we throw a little cybersecurity in there too, uh, just to make sure. So we we make sure that happens this month, engineering cannabis. I'm out. Like I said, everybody have a good week. Uh, let's get it. Um, Kev Tex in the house, man. Um, y'all, y'all, y'all already know what he does. Go check him out. He's definitely got the help desk game on lock and a lot more. Once again, uh, JM, he did a, an awesome Azure entry um, stream with, I forgot that guy's name. He was an Azure, I'm going to call him an architect. Uh, I learned a lot from Kev Tex Azure stream. Kev Tech, did you make that a playlist? Um, I, I don't know if it's straight on your channel, but uh, Kev Tech did Azure. Um, I'm calling it tutorial, Ryan. Go, is that a playlist on your channel, Kev Tech? JM, go check out Kev Tech. He did a great Azure uh, beginning. Um, it was about six six videos, Kev Tech. It was quite a few. Um, I really enjoyed it. I actually learned a lot. I don't do a ton of Azure. Uh, so, JM, check out Kev Tech for the Azure. I mean, he does way more than help desk. I, I think we need to stop calling him help desk, man. We got to give him a, a bigger title, man. We 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 pigeonhole Kev Tech, man. We can't call him help desk. So he did a an an, uh, an excellent Azure. Um, I I would call it, it. It's a little more than entry level, but it, it was good. Like he did the lab. I mean, he was showing and showing. So he's that's where I'm trying to get to. To be honest, like I said, I got to lab a little more. I've been lecturing. I got to get my lab game up. Facts, yes. <laughs> Uh, you you got that Azure in a, a playlist, Kev Tech, that y'all did? Happy birthday. I did see that on it. Everybody wish uh, Kev Tech a happy birthday, man. But, uh, yeah, um, Kev, uh, JM, check out Kev Tech's channel. He did an Azure. He did an Azure. Um, I don't, is this, it, I, I guess it was an Azure series. It, it probably was at least a month long, wasn't it, Kev Tech? But, yeah, JM, go check out uh, Kev Tech. He's got a nice Azure uh, series that are out there. Like I said, there's so many people out here doing good work. So, Jam, I don't know if you're still on. Uh, Kev, let's Kev Tech got that playlist there for you. If not, I'll get it to uh, Jam. Jam, you see that? I don't know if he's still on. He might have cut out. Mm. I'm out, everybody. Uh, Jam, check that uh, playlist out for Azure. Uh, if not, I'll get that to you when I uh, send you, uh, put on my. Um, PowerPoint into a Google Drive. I need. To, I think I need to rant, re, <laughs> rename those. Yeah, happy birthday, Kev Tech. Thanks, Game Over. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. It's always going to be Sunday at 3 unless something comes up. Um, like I said, I, I was surprised that um, I got so much love during uh, football season. <laughs> I was surprised. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, everybody have a great week. Let's get it. Uh, Good luck on your new job. I'm sure you'll be fine, Kev Tech. If you ever need me, just let me know. Uh, my old term, my Rolodex is deep. <laughs> if you need somebody, I might be able to hook out with you. And two is if uh, I know you send me a couple people uh, to talk about uh, cybersecurity. So just keep sending them up, keep sending them my way, Kev Tech. If I, if I can help you help them, just let me know, man. I see you doing good work. So I just want to add my two cents to it. So Kev Tech is just. <laughs> Kev Tech do it all, man. <laughs> so, so yeah, shout it out. So, yeah, Kev Tech, uh, you know, definitely share this platform with me. Definitely always sending people my way. So, if Kev Tech needs anything, just send them my way, Kev. I got them. I appreciate it. I'm done. Yeah, I'm about to go lay down. I'm tired, man. <laughs> I tell everybody have a great weekend. I'm out, man.